Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Failure Modes, Effects, Analysis, and Model-Based Systems Engineering. My name is Donna Long and I will be your host during today's webinar, presented by Ron Kratzky. Our lead presenter today is Ron, Principal Systems Engineer at, at Vitek. He is a retired United States Navy officer with over 20 years of engineering experience managing nuclear engineering and combat systems on surface ships. Ron was introduced to the systems engineering practice near the end of his naval career while conducting mission and capability analysis for the Navy staff. For the last 15 years, he has worked as a systems engineer supporting advanced systems development for a number of federal government agencies. He was introduced to CORE in 2007 and utilized CORE to manage system development tasks on three different projects in the five years before he joined Vitek. He is now a provider of professional services in Genesis and CORE, as well as a central part of the Vitek training team. Before Ron gets started, I have a few housekeeping items. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in as soon as you think of them through the questions tab on the webinar control panel. Ron will answer as many questions as he can today, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. If you experience connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be available within one business day. The recording will be published to Vitex webinar archive located on our website. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ron. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Donna. Um, and I'm excited to give this presentation here. I've done uh, a good bit of, an, of looking at how we can do this. This is uh, this uh, the object of uh, or being able to do failure modes effects analysis is something that um, several customers have asked us to look at over the years. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, walk through um, talk about what uh, failure modes effects analysis is and, and how it's used. Um, I know that some of our uh, listeners today probably understand what FMEA is, but a number of people do not, and they're looking at how they could use this in their in their design efforts. So I'm going to talk, take a little bit of time and talk about what the FMEA is, how it's used, and some of the different uh, procedures that are there there are out there and references. And then I'm going to walk into how I looked at the schema and how I made the schema change. So not only is this is this talk going to talk about how to do FMEA in the model-based world, but I'm really going to take my time and walk through how I made some of the decisions to make the schema changes that I did here. So this will also benefit a number of the listeners in that it'll help you to understand how to do a schema change or some of the things to consider as you're doing a schema change. So let's uh, get into this by first looking at an FMEA. So uh, failure modes effects analysis, and you'll hear me say it, FMEA or FMEA as I'm, as I'm talking through this. So a failure modes and effects analysis, and, and <clears throat> again, it's also called a FMEA depending upon what industry or what group you, you, you're, you're talking through. So there's a FMEA and a failure modes effects and criticality analysis. So there's a little bit of difference between those two, and this is one of the challenges here in this, in that I'm trying to make a schema extension that'll talk across many different industries, not just a particular uh, industry set. And so regardless, but regardless of whether you're doing a FAMIA or a FAMICA, your industry and probably your company has a particular way of doing it. And they might call it a design FMEA or a process FMEA, or they might call it a subsystem FMEA. Regardless of what you do, the basic methodology it, for any type of FAMIA is the same. And what, what we're really talking about here is identifying ways that the system can fail. Now I'm going to use the term system here, and that may be a system, it may be a system element, a segment, a subsystem, or a component. But we're, you're going to identify a failure mode. You're going to assess that failure mode. You're going to say, is that is that critical? Is that how critical is that failure mode? Then you're going to look at, you know, um, 
what, what's the rank order of these failure modes? Some of these things you might be willing to accept or you don't have to do a design change. You can do a procedural change or do some training or something like that. So it's not what I would call a critical failure. And then when we do end up with a set of critical failures, that may end up uh, or that will end up with some corrective actions. And those might result in having to change the, the system design or do something else in the overall life cycle of the product. So some references here. Now, there's a there's a, a textbook that a lot of people reference at the very top here, Failure Modes Effects Analysis from Theory to Execution by, uh, by uh, Stamatis, and I hope I'm saying that right. It's, it's produced by the Quality Press. That's sort of a, a well-rounded overall particular or overall book that talks in depth about many different types of FAMIAs. And if you're, if you're doing this, a lot and you're really involved in this in your industry, I would recommend picking up a copy of that because it talks about things from a very wide view perspective. But then we get into particular ways that it's done in a particular industry. There, there is a mill standard 1629 out there, uh, failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis. That standard was actually canceled I think it was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it was canceled because there's so many um, there's so many industry standards out there that the military said apply one of the military standards here. Nonetheless, though, that military standard is also another good reference for background material on how to do this. Now, there's a great there's also a great web page that I've listed there, uh, Weibel.com Basics for Mia, and that Weibel.com actually is a good is a good source for anyone looking at anything to do with uh, reliability engineering or quality control and those sorts of stuff. But there is a FAMIA page there that talks about it. Now, <clears throat> at the bottom there, there's a couple of uh, guidance documents um, that um, are used in the industry. So there's, a, there's an automotive industry reference for potential failure modes and effects. It's a reference. Uh, now, what I'm quoting there is the reference manual for this. And I last accessed that just a couple days ago. That's the free version of the 1995, or that's the publicly accessible version of the 1995 uh, automotive industry for me. Uh, if you want to get the most recent one, of course, you need to be a member of the Society of Automotive Engineering or you have to pay for it. Um, there's, a, there's also a guidance for risk management that the FDA uses. And there's also at the bottom there uh, a human factors and usability engineering on medical devices, which is an FDA publication. And those publications, because they're part of the FDA, of course, you can access them because they're, they're produced by the federal government. So what are the elements that are needed in an FMEA? So we talked about failure mode analysis. And what we're trying to do is we want to identify the failure modes, the failure rates, and the root causes of those failures. So some few definitions here. The failure mode is any manner in which the system can fail, OK? Fail to meet its intended purpose or function. So that right there tells me that when I have a failure mode, I've got to relate that failure mode back to the system or a function or some part of the system design that says this thing, if done, if something happens to this particular element, system element, then I could have a failure. And then the, uh, there's a thing called the failure effect, which is really a description of the impact of the failure mode. What happens when something fails? What's that going to do to my system? And then we try to figure out what is the root cause. How, you know, what's the root cause of this failure? Okay, the system loses power. Well, you could lose power for many reasons. You could lose power because a fuse blows. You could lose power because someone pulls the plug. You could lose power um, because a circuit card um, failed, whatever. So you've got to get to some root causes. Now, you're probably thinking here that, oh, well, if I have a failure effect, I could have multiple causes. And in fact, that's the way this is done. So I could have a failure, but it could be caused by one or more things. And so we're going to have to have a failure effect, the failure mode and failure effect related to some root causes or the, the what I call the failure cause. And then how would we determine that failure? For example, when something fails, sometimes you'll get a warning light or something won't work or... Uh, or you'll get uh, a change in some uh, monitoring value or statist or a critical uh, parameter or something on the system. So we look for what's the detection method? How do we control the failure or how do we detect the failure? So <clears throat> 
just looking at this, I have a failure mode. I'm going to get a failure effect. I'm going to get some sort of failure cause. And then I'm going to find some detection method for that. So <clears throat> that's the basic process as I start looking at the system. So I'm going to start with a system element, of course, which isn't really on this diagram. But I'm going to, get, I'm going to identify a failure mode, figure out a failure effect, what's the cause for that, and how would I detect it. Now, <clears throat> there's a methodology in, in FMEA where we, we rank the failure effect, the failure cause, and the failure detection, detection method. So we look, at, we look at what's the severity of the effect, what is the occurrence, how often would this, would this, would this thing occur, and we look at how we would, the, uh, our ability to detect that failure. So what happens is we end up with relating a severity with the effect, an occurrence value with the failure cause, and a detection value with the detection method. So we have to pull all those things together in, in, in this analysis. So <clears throat> taking this severity, occurrence, and detectability, well, what are, what are those? How do I figure those out? So I'm going to walk through the severity, occurrence, and detectability for a moment. So <clears throat> wherever you are, if you, as you're doing this, you're going to have some sort of severity rank, ranking. Now, um, in my schema extension, I'm going to use the table that's the tables that are shown here. It's understandable that you would likely have a different set of uh, severity ratings for your industry or your particular project or your particular design. But you're going to have you will generally have a rank order from one to ten using these generic effects of none through hazardous. Now, the criteria or the definition of these things might change based upon your industry or your particular product, but you're always going to have a rank from 1 to 10 with some sort of effect going from essentially none or very slight all the way up through something that's very hazardous. So we have a set of criteria here. Again, this is taken from that textbook, the FMEA textbook that I talked about. But if you're like in the FDA industry, there's probably a different set of values for what these criteria are. Um, you can see here they talk about the, the customer experience on here. And then with, there's also a, a generally um, some sort of uh, definition here for moderate effect on system or, system or product performance. If you, look, if you look right here at the moderate one, it says customer experience is somewhat dissatisfaction and, in, in, you know, how do you and how do you uh, whether it's moderate or protect product or performance. Now, one of the things here is as you're doing this as a group and you're looking at FMEA, the general guideline is if you can't figure out whether it's moderate or significant, you, you keep going back and forth between the two, the best thing to do is to take the most, the, the, the most significant or the higher ranking and just go forward with that. So a lot of times when you look at this, you, you think, well, I really can't figure out should it be moderate or significant? I don't know. In some cases it is or it isn't. Pick the higher value and, and push on with your analysis because it's not just this particular severity rating that's going to be that's going to be a problem. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. And then we have an occurrence rating. So when something um, when we do have this failure um, uh, this failure effect, we, we want to figure out how often is it going to occur. Again, a table here rank ordering from one to ten, almost never to almost certain with some criteria. Now, way over here on the right-hand side, you'll see this cumulative number of failures per thousand, okay? So this is the cumulative number of failures you might have through per thousand, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say events. It could be operating hours or it could be number of times you use the system. Now, this oftentimes gets confused with reliability analysis, and people will say, well, why isn't this just a reliability number? Well, reliability certainly has a play in figuring out the occurrence, but it's not the only thing that you, that you use when you pull this occurrence value together. And what you want to look at is the cumulative number of failures that you have per thousand, and you might, might be per 10,000 hours. It, it, it depends upon, again, this is very much industry-driven but this is a generic guideline to use. If you're new to this and you're thinking of bringing this on, this is sort of the generic guidelines that I would suggest you use. 
Um, so the, the occurrence is related to the failure cause, and it really looks at the cumulative number of failures that you're going to have per thousand um, operating hours or thousand times you're using this system or whatever it is based upon, depending upon how your system is used, is utilized. So <clears throat> finally, we have detectability rating. What's the ability of the design to detect the, the, the potential failure mode, either detect it before it's before it's um, before it occurs, or to be able to pinpoint what the cause is after it has occurred, so you can make a quick repair and minimize your your, your repairability. Again, there's a rank order from one to ten, almost certain to almost impossible. We have some criteria there um, to kind of understand what that what that means. Okay. So we understand what um, the occurrence is, we understand what the uh, detectability is, we understand what the severity is. So <clears throat> what we want to know is, is taking these effects, so we have a failure effect, some severity, we have a failure cause, some occurrence rating, we want to find out what's the criticality, what's the relative measure of the combined influences here for the system failure. So this is what this is really gets to where we're to, to the meat of the issue here is based upon some severity level and some number of times it occurs, it's telling us how overall critical this failure mode is to the operation of my system. So what we do is we take that integer number, that severity number, we take that occurrence number, we multiply those together and we get some criticality value. So um, it's telling us a measure of the combined influence of the consequence of a failure and its frequency, okay? There's one other statistic that we can pull out here, and that is <coughs> the, the, the detection method. So <coughs> there's, a, there's a value in FMEA generally called the risk priority number. Now, I don't mean risk here in the sense of a program risk, what you're normally used to looking at a risk cube, okay? But this risk priority number does play into the risk evaluation of the system. So be very careful here. This is a relative measure to rank order the potential of system failures. In other words, if I have a, a severity, if, if I have a failure that occurs on a certain uh, frequency and I can't detect it, in other words, there's no, there's no way for me to detect that failure, that would be a highly risky thing in my system. But if I have some failure effect and I have some occurrence, but I know I can detect that early on and know when it's, <clears throat> when it's either on the verge of failure or I can make the detection as soon as it occurs, then that wouldn't be as risky to the overall system operation as other things, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> um, so we get this RPN value and it's really the product of the severity, the uh, occurrence, and the detectability. Now, before we go any further here, let's think about this. The severity is one to 10. The occurrence has a value of one to 10. Detectability has a value of one to 10. So that RPN is gonna be a number from one to 1,000. That's the maximum it could be. Minimum of one if all these were one, Maximum of 1,000 if all of these were 10. So you're going to get a wide variety of detect of RPNs here, and that'll be that'll become critical as we start as we look at this analysis a little bit later on. So, <clears throat> so when we want to do an FMEA, we want to figure out um, what what we get. We want to improve the system design. And so we're going to take those, we're going to, we're also going to then, once we have this FMEA, look at recommended actions to reduce the severity, occurrence, or detection, or all three of them. So many times you're going to rank your, your failures, either by criticality or RPN, and then you're going to look at how can I reduce these failures? What, what action would I take? Would I change the system or would I do some, some other action? So those things are going to become critical as we look at this. All right, so enough of the theory. Let's look at some basic examples. So this is a very generic FMEA table, not written to any specific um, 
industry. Again, it's taken from this, uh, it's taken from this overall uh, textbook that I have. So here, here we have a potential failure mode. So we've, we're listing some failure modes. It occurs based upon this, this function called dispensing the amount of cash requested by a customer. So now I have a potential failure effect here. So here is a, here, and here's a severity level for these, and then we're getting to some causes. So here's some causes out of cash, machine jams, power failure. You can see here now I've got some occurrence values. And then I have some process controls or detectability, internal low cash alert, internal jam alert. There's nothing for this one. So we have these de detectability values built in here for this. And now we're looking at, in this, in this particular table, they calculate the risk priority number and then the criticality. So here's the criticality, right? It's, it's, it's this number eight times five would be 40 for the criticality here. And then the risk priority number would be this 40 times the detectability to be 200, okay? And so here we've got a list of uh, RPNs here. And we may decide on based upon what we're doing with our system that everything over 200 or anything over 150 or something needs to be needs to be corrected. And then this table is a little bit incomplete in my mind because there's no recommended actions for any of these and there's no responsibility and completion and there's no revision here on what happens after I take the, the, the completed action. But it is a table none the same and it is a way for us to look at the failure of the system. And this might be the first step in this in their process. Let's look at the automotive industry. Automotive industry, <coughs> And this comes from the uh, the, the Weibull uh, website. They do the same thing. They look at a failure mode. They look at effect. Then they, they have the severity number. They look at the potential causes. Here you've got three causes for this one failure mode. And then we look at some process controls. And we come up with this risk priority number. They don't calculate a criticality necessarily. They just go directly to an RPN. That's the way the automotive industry does it. Then we have some recommended actions. Who's going to do it? and then some revisions out here as to what happens after I take these actions. So this is the way <clears throat> um, the healthcare industry does it. They look at a healthcare failure modes and effects analysis, and this is on a, a, a particular product. So again, we have a process or a, or a component. We have a failure mode. We have a cause. We have an effect or a, or a, uh, of that, and then we have a severity. And they call it probability, which is really the rank, the occurrence order, and they get a hazard score instead of a criticality value. Two times four is eight, four times three is 12, and then they look at what they can do to, 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 to change that. Okay. So <clears throat> what I want to do now that I've looked at how to do this, I've looked at the, the types of things I have to do, I want to capture all of these nuances between the, the different the different things and come up with a with a generic way of doing it um, with my with my schema with my organization in Genesis so <clears throat> I want to extend it, it, expand the standard schema and I want to be able to provide these elements that we've seen in these tables to do failure modes and effects analysis I want to trace from the design to the FMEA table and I want to trace any changes I make and what and how I would correct those change or I want to trace to any um, <clears throat> any recommended actions and trace that into how I'm going to change the system design. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on now for the next few slides. So again, in this table, I have to identify the failure mode and I have to identify the cause and um, and what process controls or what monitoring efforts I have. So those are the fundamental elements I've got to get to. I can calculate the RPN and criticality if I've if I put together the elements that I have circled in red. So again, before I launch into this, I want to think about it carefully. I want a failure mode in the model. I want the failure mode such that I can have multiple failure causes. I want to connect the design model to the FMEA through some relationships. So I have to think about what kind of um, entities or, or classes do I need? How are they going to relate to the system design? What sort of attributes do I need to have on those classes? And I want to do it in such a way that I can create 
an FMEA table, similar to the ones that I've, that I've just shown. So <clears throat> I know I need to have a class to capture the failure modes, okay? So I'm going to start by saying, okay, I've got to have a failure mode, and I want to relate it to these components, functions, interfaces, items, you know, different things in my model. So, again, uh, so I'm starting to build up what I think I should, what I think I would need in my, in my extension here. So the failure mode, I'm going to need a name, a number, description, right? Everything in Genesis has a name, number, and description associated with it. And then I have other attributes to help describe it. In this case, the only other thing I need to have here is this severity. In other words, the name would map to the potential failure mode, the description would be the potential effects, and all I need here is a severity level. But now I get to this cause. So I need a name, number, a description, so this is the potential description. I need to get this occurrence. I need to get a control or a method of, of how I'm going to detect it. Then I need to have a detection. And then I need to be able to calculate these RPNs and this criticality value. Okay. And again, I can have one failure cause ending up in several different failure modes. So, or one failure mode ending up in several different causes. So, <clears throat> What I do then is I start to put this together conceptually in a in a um, in a graphical form. So what you're going to see here is I'm going to look at creating this failure mode. I've identified which things I want in the failure mode. I want to add a, a class for failure cause. These are the things I want to put into that failure cause. I want to put things like um, the description, the occurrence, detection method, detectability, and then. I also want to relate this failure cause to some failure reduction effort, and I want to put in the recommended action, who's going to do it, when it's going to be done, and what an updated occurrence and detectability. Well, that's fine if I want to say this is what my failure action is, but that has to get related back to my model. So I'm going to use some things that already exist in the schema. I'm going to use the risk class and this thing called the nexus class, which really contains the concern class and the change class. So a failure reduction after I figure out what I want to do, I'm going to relate it to either a concern or a change if the, th if, the, if the system is already under configuration control, or it might be a risk that I want to accept in my system design. And we're going to ident relate those things then back to what actually caused them. So let's look at this. How do I extend the schema? In Genesis, it's a little bit different than core if I have some core users out there. Um, so in Genesis, the way I can the way I go about making this change is I go to the schema tab, and once I'm on the schema tab, I can edit the schema. Now I can select the button that's highlighted right here. It's actually grayed out because I'm actually in the schema mode on this slide, but I would click on that button and it would change to, to it would change the model to this view. You'll notice that when you're in the schema mode here, you cannot look at the data in the project. You can only look at the schema, and this is showing me the organization of the schema here in the browser window, okay? <clears throat> now, there's buttons up here that allow you to add a class, add a facility. They're all over here in this in this part of the, uh, the, the ribbon bar. And when you get all done, or as you're doing the as you're doing the schema change, you can check the schema for consistency, see if you have any errors, correct your errors. And if you really goon it up and you don't want to, you want to stop, you can actually cancel it and go back and start again. But at the end, when you're all done changing the schema, what you'll do is you'll you'll um, you can um, push the button here for end schema editing. It'll actually go through and do a to check of the schema consistency and if the schema consistency is fine then it will allow you to go on and go back to the project mode then you can start uh, start editing so <clears throat> what i did in genesis is i added these three classes failure reduction failure failure mode failure cause and failure reduction right those three big blocks that i showed earlier on in the presentation now <clears throat> Each of these, as we look at them, the description, number, and name, this is the, I've selected an engineering element here because I'm making these things subclasses of an engineering element. So they're going to inherit these attributes and they're going to inherit 
these relationships, okay? So what you've seen a few moments here is I'm going to talk about how I created each of those, each of those um, new classes. So when you look in, when you look at the model, I've also created a new facility called Failure Mode Analysis. So what I what I also did was I created a facility which focused in on here's what I'm going to do if I'm doing failure mode analysis. I don't need documentation. I don't need all sorts of uh, program management elements. I'm just looking at components, interfaces, functions, links, requirements, and I'm identifying what failure modes I have. So I, I slimmed down the overall list into this new facility called failure mode. And again, I have these three new classes. So just as a review here, we're going to go back. Let's look at the schema extension one more time. This is what I want to do, and I'm going to look at, okay, I want to make the failure mode. I want to create this class called the failure mode. What do I need to do? So here's the class called failure mode. So I made this new class called failure mode, and I added some attributes for severity, and I added some relationships created by and introduced by because these were the relationships I had here, okay? So a failure mode is created by a a, um, a a failure cause and a failure mode is introduced by reading the arrow backwards to a component, a link, an element, or an interface and things like that. Now I add it so I can have a description and a number. This is where I can populate what the failure mode is. And here I have my severity from one to 10, okay? And then underneath here, you'll see there's a severity rank, which is just the numeric value, the integer value of what this is, of what these this string value is. So <clears throat> to create a new relation, this is sometimes a sticky point um, in a schema extension. But what I wanted to do when I, is I create a new relation, and I want to, when I want to create those relations, I want to make them unique. The reason I want to make them unique is <clears throat> that way um, I don't end up putting these uh, failure elements, failure mode elements into a report that's already been create, that's already been architected someplace. And likewise, I can create distinct reports for the failure mode analysis in separate in um, it, separately from all other sorts of reports. So when you do this, when you hit this button here under the schema it changes says new relations, uh, the the dialog box comes up and you need to you have to create two new relational names. In this case, I created a created by and a creates. Okay, and so this is this is showing the relation between the failure mode um, element and the uh, failure causes. Okay, and the 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 big thing here is you've got to create this name. And you've got to give some sort of description here, okay? And then I added some attributes here: the hazard value, which is going to contain my my uh, occurrence value, and then the risk priority number, which is going to contain the RPN. So on this relationship, this is where I'm going to put these two uh, values. All right. <clears throat> so the next one, I so I've already created the relationships here. I've created the relationships here. I've created the relationships here, so now I need to create this failure cause, okay? So on the next slide, you'll see a failure cause. So here, <clears throat> the failure cause, I've got the name, number, description. Then I have the method or control, the detection method or the control method. Here's the detectability, and here's the occurrence. If you go back to the schema chart, we had a creates. In other words, that, that failure cause creates a failure and it's mitigated by a failure reduction method if we need that. So those are the relationships that I have. So continuing on, the next thing I need to do is to create this failure reduction. Um, when I do that, <clears throat> I want the description. I want some recommended action. I want someone to be responsible to do it. I'm going to assign them a due date. And I need an updated occurrence and an updated detectability. And that re failure reduction mitigates that failure cause. Now, you'll also notice here, <clears throat> failure reduction, I also put in the causes and generates relationships 
because I want the failure reduction to be related to a concern or a change or a risk in my architecture. Okay. So <clears throat> we made all those elements. We next want to come up with, with some sort of uh, relate. We want to be able to put the elements into a model and we want to come up with a, some sort of table that looks similar to this table. And I'm going to concentrate on the items down here. Okay, I got to figure out how to get all these items into a table. So <clears throat> the first thing is <clears throat> we want to go back to this. We, we want to create a report. I like to start in the Excel connector and make a basic table here, and make sure I have all of my logic down. So <clears throat> I have to go, I have to walk a little bit backwards. I have to, I'm, I'm picking up the failure modes. I'm going to start with the failure modes. But first, I have to go back and see how was that failure mode introduced. So it was introduced by some component, OK? Next, I have to look at the failure mode. I want the description of that failure. I can pull in the severity number. It was created by some failure, um, some failure cause. You'll notice here, what I'm doing here is I'm doing a relationship targets. And I'm not going to show that column. Because what I want to do is then pull up the description of that failure cause and that occurrence value. Okay. And notice how I have failure mode here. So I can pull those out and let's look at the table that that creates. So that I create a table that looks like this. In my model, I had some system elements. Here's some failures. I have these descriptions here. I have a severity level. I have a failure cause. I have an occurrence and I have a detection method. Now you'll notice here that this particular failure was caused by two, two things here. So I have two different causes here and I have two different detection methods for those causes. So that's looking pretty good. I mean, it, when now, um, when you actually create this table in Excel, I did have to do a little bit of formatting to like move these to be, um, these labels to be, uh, you know, aligned uh, vertically instead of horizontally. Um, but you, you, you can pull that information out relatively quickly. And just like, uh, just like we, we do in requirements, I can take these and I can actually, um, I can actually uh, edit these, these attributes and push them back in, back into uh, to Genesis. But that's not enough because I also need to look at, um, I need to pull up the criticality value and the risk priority number. <clears throat> so here I extended the, the table that I just had and I'm gonna pull up this relationship created by this time. And the reason I'm pulling up a relationship instead of relationship targets is I wanna pull up the relationship because I wanna pull up a relationship attribute the hazard value and the risk priority number. So here's hazard value and here's risk priority. Here's risk priority number, excuse me, and here's hazard value. So this time I pull up the relationship. I'm not going to show this column. Instead, what I'm going to do is once I have that relationship based upon the data, I'm then going to pull up the relationship attribute based upon the relationship that I have in, in row 10 of the, of the model and then the risk priority number. So when I do that, I then get this table. Now, <clears throat> currently, the way I have the schema extended, I actually put a formula in the Excel spreadsheet to calculate the criticality and the risk priority number. What I'm going to do uh, late, the next step in my development here is I'll write a script that basically says, given all these values, automatically populate this relationship attribute called, called criticality and populate this risk priority number. So I won't, need to, I won't need to do that in Excel. And that would just be a script that I would write in the model and just, uh, just like we do the scripts for setting the risk, uh, the risk uh, is high, medium, and low, I'll, I'll create a script that does the update of these two relationship attributes based upon severity, occurrence, and detectability.
but ultimately then I will be able to get this table. So now we see, oh, I've got some, I've got a few of these risk priority numbers that have high values. In other words, I'm looking at these high risk, these high value risk priority numbers. So if I was doing this, let's say the next step would be, can I figure out a way I want to take and reduce these? So I need to figure out a method for how I'm going to reduce them. So this is that failure reduction part that I talked about a few moments ago. So now based of those two failure causes need to have some failure reduction method associated with them. So I'm going to describe a failure reduction method, a recommended action, some sort of responsibility and due date for those, um, and update the occurrence and detectability. Well, if I've already created the table that takes that pulls this out and pulls this out, and then I took a table that has all this out, I just need to extend that table one more time to pull this information out. So and that's what I'm doing down here. <clears throat> uh, a few moments ago, I had the criticality and the RPN based upon what was in row 10. Now I'm going to pull up the relationship, what is mit it, I, what is the relationship target mitigated by. Now notice I'm going back to row five because row five was what created it, what, what failure cause was there. So now once I have that, now I have the list of failure reduction methods. I don't want to show them. Rather, I want to report on the recommended action, then the recommended action here, the responsibility, who's going to do it, what's the due date to complete that, what would be the new occurrence value, and what would be the updated detectability. Okay? <clears throat> so I'm just going to, I'm going to, I have to go in the model, pick up those RPNs that are over 150, let's say, create the failure reduction method, and then go back in, populate these, these values, and then I can extend this table to provide this information. So next, I get to this. And you'll see here that <clears throat> these ones here, which are less than the value, they don't need to have a recommended action. But now I can, I can look at these. Here's the recommended action. Here's who's responsible for them. Here's when it's due. And once they're done, here's the new occurrence and detectability value. Now, I just, frankly, I just assigned the numbers too because I wanted to make, show a significant change between what's here in the detect detectability here over detectability there. And so now I have these new values, two and two. Okay. <clears throat> so that gets me the table, uh, very similar to the tables that I have. And again, now I have these three tables. They could be modified to meet whatever you need to do in your um, in your uh, in your particular industry. So next, <clears throat> if I have a set of failure reductions, how do I take those failure reductions and relate those to changes in the model? Well, because this information is in the schema, I can either pull that out through a table or I could pull it out through uh, a hierarchy. And I just want to know that failure reduction is going to generate some change request or some concern, which is going to result in something new in my architecture. So I can do this using a hierarchy. So <clears throat> when I get to this, I can look at creating a custom hierarchy. We do this all the time for many different for many different things. So I'm going to look at a failure reduction hierarchy. I'm going to create the hierarchy in um, you know in Genesis. And what I'm looking at is causes, generates, and impacts, right? Because if I look at this, I have causes and generates and results in or impacts. So again, I have generates and causes. And when I get those, I want to know what those things result in or what they impact in the design. So, so I have this failure reduction. 
So I'm, uh, excuse me. So I'm going to make this custom hierarchy. I'm going to call it the failure reduction hierarchy. And I'm going to use just these relationships. And when I do that, this would show me this failure reduction, unique fan motor mount generates a change request package, which results in this new requirement being added to the design, the fan motor mount requirement. It could also result in a new fan motor mount uh, interface or whatever else. It, it, yeah, I'm just trying to show this as a generic uh, way to, to show that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> many times when we're doing this, we have different levels of Famica. We might do it for a certain component or a subsystem or a package in the, in the architecture. So one of the things we also want to th think about is, can I package these failure modes up somehow so that I can report on just one particular segment of the failure mode uh, of a, a failure analysis? I might do an early failure analysis just on an operating concept or a system level report, or I might do something on a subsystem or a component. So there's a couple of different ways we could handle that. I could create individual folders within the failure mode class and then just report on a particular folder, but that's gonna require multiple different sort of reports. I could create a category, so I could say system level failures as a category, and then I could um, pull in the failure modes that are categorized by that category. And then I would just go back and modify um, a report so that I pick a particular category uh, and then make the the report based starting from that category. Another option would be to create a package. So I could create a package like a system level uh, analysis package and I could include in that package the failure modes that went into the system design into the system analysis with all the failure causes and all the failure reduction methods. So it really depends upon how you want to organize the model, what makes the most sense for you what makes the most sense for the number of ways you're looking at at your design um, and and the products that you have to produce right if your simp says just produce subsystem analysis of of FEMIA, then that would be something different than having to do it at each and every design review or each and every step along the way so you had this the answer to this question really kind of goes back to how do you need to manage this based upon your particular product and project plan. So finally, <clears throat> just um, a lot of people uh, have always asked me, well, I've created this schema extension. I created this in this uh, fake database, if you will. I want to move this schema extension over into this design project that I'm currently working on. Well, the way you do that is you go to export the project. And when you do that, you want to switch to project schema. Normally, when you export a project, you get this project backup part, okay? If you just want the schema changes, you want to select project schema. And when you do that, these are the elements you're going to end up pulling out of your particular project. So I have this fake database here, if you will, or just a... Uh, exploratory database and if I select project schema as a way to save it I'm going to change the schema the facilities remember I created that new facility for doing FMEA analysis I create I can create filter definitions I have a, I have a unique hierarchy I have sort tables and I have I have sort definitions and I have table definitions so all those table definitions that I had for the basic FMEA for the FMEA extended and for the FMEA with the um, with the uh, uh, failure reduction methods. All those table definitions will be saved. And when I export that, then I can take that particular project and I can import that project into my overall system design, um, you know, because I, I may have built up a, a huge system design, okay? So that, that's how to, how to export that. Now, the good news is, if you liked what we're doing here with this FMEA extension, you don't need to create that on your own. You don't need to ask Donna for the slides and try to get all these slides because we're going. We're, we are likely, I would say, 
assured we're going to create a schema extension out of this. Well, once I put a few more uh, scripts in there to make managing this a little bit easier, but we're going to package a schema extension and push that out with um, with a future uh, release of uh, of Genesis. So you'll have all the things that I talked about in here as part of a FMEA extension, and you can import that into your project and you can go off and customize it. So if you're in the automotive industry and you need a different order of those of those columns, or you're in the uh, the uh, uh, a drug or a healthcare industry, you can you can pick just a few of the, the elements that I have here. You may not have to do all the RPN. You may just be doing a use case or a hazard analysis. So you want to get a hazard value. So you can only you'll be able to just pick parts of that or or utilize the whole thing, and you can customize it based upon what you need. So. Donna, I need to take a breath and uh, here in just a moment, and I'll turn it over for questions. But in, in summary here, what I tried to do was look at how to do a basic FMEA. It may not quite meet your, your needs in your particular industry, but I've got the basics in here, so you can customize that a little more. I talked about how to, how to do a schema extension, the sorts of things I think through when I'm gonna do a schema extension, sketching that schema extension first, on a piece of paper or on a PowerPoint chart, and then <clears throat> actually creating the schema step by step, or the schema change in in Genesis, and then how to create those reports. You know, I, again, I like to start small, take a few things out, make sure that's working, go to the next level, the next level, and save those intermediate steps so you have them. And then we also did a, a, a hierarchy trace. Now there could be other traces you want to put together in that in that also. And then I talked about how to save that schema change and how to use it in other projects. And then finally, I talked about the fact we're probably, we are gonna put out a schema extension to once we uh, finalize some of these, uh, these things. So uh, Donna, I hope you have some questions for me and uh, I'm gonna take a quick drink of water while you get those ready. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Yes, we do have a few questions. I just wanted to um, follow on with Ron's comment about our extensions. Anybody who has Core or Genesis can look under their data. We have an extensions folder and we have security classifications and standard compliance already deployed. Um, but look there for any more information if you're looking to extend your schemas. We've got um, examples and um, documentation on how to use those. So to get back to FMEA, um, the questions we have, Ron, We've got one from Sarah that says on page 41 under failure heading, were they failure modes or failure causes? Um, <clears throat> maybe I can go back here and I can explain that. So failure, the way this maps in, in my, this particular instance is this is the, the failure name and this is the description of what happens for that failure. How do I know what it, what it's doing? Okay, and then this is what causes that thing from to occur. Did that? I hope hopefully that answered the question. If not, send us a little send on a, or send us a note, and we'll uh, I can uh, explain uh, further how that maps to the schema. Okay, I'll look to see if when she um, replies. Okay, um, Cynthia has responded um, with grading the failures across the system um, and how does one failure impact another component of the system? Well, <clears throat> there's a there's a part, so let me just address how does it affect another component. It, many times in this in an FMEA process you're doing a system level analysis first and you might have a cause that says, oh, it's this subsystem failed, this, sub, this subsystem failed. And so then you may end up going into the subsystem FMEA to determine exactly what component could have caused that particular failure. So there is a little bit of a ripple effect up and down here by these. So sometimes you may end up actually taking in, in practice a system level failure and say, I need to, I need to fix this in the subsystem somehow. And I think that's what you're asking. Can you re read the question for me again, Don, to make sure I got all, all parts of it? Yeah, as soon as I get off mute. It says, <laughs> grading the failures across the system, and how does one failure impact another component of the system? 
Well, uh, and the other thing is, I'm going to go to this slide here, okay? If I had a failure cause at the system level, I might say the reduction would be in doing something at the subsystem. So then I would, I would then say this generates a concern here. Oh, let me go back up. Excuse me. So then this failure reduction effort might then also generate a concern instead of a change that says we need to do something in a subsystem to, to help uh, lower the occurrence and detectability of this particular failure mode. So there's various ways to do that, that traceability back and forth. Okay, um, Cynthia had also followed on with um, earlier in the presentation, she said dynamic detection. And I'm not 100% sure what she means by that, but that was early in the presentation. Well, I, I believe if your system has some way to dynamically detect pending failures, then that dynamic detection would affect the de detectability rating of a, of a particular failure mode. Okay. Um, okay. I just want, wasn't sure if that was a follow-on from what from the other one. So let's move on. Um, Daniel has asked, how would you apply FMEA to software where there might be emergent behaviors that cause other things that are unknown? Well, there's no uh, th there's no uh, golden nugget here. I it, it it's really you've got to base an SME that knows how the software works. If they think it's going to have some sort of emergent behavior, then they need to identify that failure mode and put it in here um, and put it into the into the FMEA. But there's not a uh, I, I don't necessarily have a, a a particular golden nugget that says you know we we can do that analysis and come up with it in in this. This is really a, a record tracking mechanism for understanding what those for keeping records of what those failure modes are and and, and the failure causes. So if you if you think you're going to have emergent behavior based upon something, or you're actually in testing and you say, oh, you know, I've got this emergent behavior and I can trace it back to this function point or this branch of the system, then I would create a failure mode for that and look at what's causing it and how I how I would reduce it. Okay. Um, Sarath also said, function is given. Where is the item? Function is given, where is the item? Well, I, so this list over here is not complete, right? A component, a function, an interface, a link, a requirement, an item. This, there's several different key elements of a design. For example, if this item or a message never is received by a particular function, I might take both the function and item and relate it to this particular failure mode. Um, this list is not, that's why there's a comma here. This list is not the exact list. There are other elements in there, but I've related the failure mode to component function, interface, link, requirement, item. And I think that's it. I think the only thing that's missing off of there is item. But I have to go back and look at that again. Okay. Um, Cynthia also sent in one to a thousand RPMs per system. One failure mode can impact downstream. How do we decide where we get the biggest bang when identifying corrective action, actions? Well, that depends upon your system architecture. So you're going to end up doing this. The RPN could be the 1 to 1,000 means that any, any failure mode could have a risk priority number between 1 and 1,000. doesn't mean that you only have 1,000 1, failure modes. Um, the biggest bang for the buck is going to be in the analysis and looking at the system architecture. If you've got a very critical, uh, I would say, I don't want to say critical, a, a high risk number, uh, you've got to look at it in the design and say, well, I can probably fix this one of a couple of different ways. And you may end up having a failure cause that's mitigated by two or three failure reductions. And you may have to go out and generate, you may have to go out and look at that as a concern and do a trade study to figure out what the best way is to, to reduce that. Um, and it could be at, at many different levels. But there's no, I don't have a, 
I, I'm not a failure mode engineer expert, so I don't have a way, I don't, don't have a set of guidelines to tell you exactly how to do that. That's okay. Sarah said thank you very much. Um, Abby Tetley from Germany is asking, is it a good idea to use the FMEA process to formally evaluate system architectures in the automotive industry? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I can't necessarily speak authoritatively for the automotive industry, but I know that looking at some of their guidance documents, it is actually required in many cases in the automotive industry. And I think that the more we start depending upon automated features for car for automotive controls, there's probably a failure mode analysis. Actually, it's probably a FAMICA, understanding both the criticality and the risk of of these of those failure modes that are, that is done. So, is it a good idea in the automotive industry? I would think so. I know that uh, I would say yes. I know that NASA does this uh, FAMICA of you know that they have a, a certain set of particular methods they use that has to be done for uh, for spacecraft. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Now, maybe maybe you're in maybe you're developing automotives uh, or automotive components and you don't do one. Maybe that's why you're asking. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, Ron, that wraps up our Q and A today. We're running out of time. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question. We'll contact you directly to ensure that it has been answered. Um, if you have other questions or comments for Ron, please don't hesitate to send him an email. Um, thank you much, so much for coming today. Join us in June for a series of webinars focused on MBSC practices within Core and Genesis. Our first one will be June 6th, from, from concept to design, making MBSC real time. For more, infra for more information, visit our website. Um, remember that at the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please do take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. That's all for today. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.